Hello friends, welcome back to Dig It With Raven. Today we are staying on theme with the last video on who built the pyramids, and we're gonna be talking about how we think they might have been built. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the engineering of the pyramids and the evolution that took place to get from little mound in the ground into full size pyramids. I do have a video talking about the actual pyramid builders themselves, where they lived, how they lived, and of course I talk about how they were neither slaves nor aliens. So make sure you go ahead and check that out as well to get a fuller picture on the whole pyramid building community. I've linked it up here in this video and it is also down in my description below. Now because most people are most familiar with the three pyramids of Giza and because all the ancient astronaut theorists only really focus on the Great Pyramid at Giza, which is the largest of the three, that is the pyramid that we are going to be focusing on, but I will be mentioning other pyramids in this video because the Egyptians built over 100 pyramids throughout the timeline of their civilization. And if you haven't heard about the other 100 pyramids and are wondering why, don't worry, we're gonna be getting into that today too. To understand the pyramids and how they fit into Egyptian funerary culture, we first need to look at how the ancient Egyptians buried their dead. Before pyramids and hidden tombs, the Egyptians used to bury their dead in very simple graves just like we do. Fancy coffins weren't really used, but the pits would sometimes be lined with reeds or wood for more stability around the edges. They would also have a few burial goods in there. Even when more complicated tombs became more favored with higher elites, this was still the popular burial method for those who couldn't afford such luxuries. The hot, dry sand that's in Egypt would naturally desiccate and mummify the remains of the people buried in there, which when found later on by people building in the area or trying to dig graves themselves, influenced their belief system. Egyptian Egyptians believed that the body needed to remain intact in order for the soul to flourish in the afterlife because it had to return to the body for sustenance and for rejuvenation. This means that people not only started to take greater care of the remains of the dead, but also what was buried with them and how these graves were protected. In the pre-dynastic era, people would be buried under large mounds of dirt and sand to be more protected from tomb robbers. But over the years, the rich transformed these mounds into mud, brick, and stone structures called mastabas. Mastaba building carried on for quite some time, but then one day around 2600 BCE, a guy named King Djoser was like, hey, I'd like to make my mastaba tomb one that everyone is gonna talk about. I don't want just one mastaba. I want six of them stacked on top of each other. And that's what they did. This series of six mastabas is now known as Djoser's Step Pyramid, and you can visit it today at Saqqara. The engineering of this Step Pyramid was all carried out by a guy named Imhotep. And no, I don't mean the evil Imhotep in the mummy movies, I mean this Imhotep. Imhotep revolutionized building in ancient Egypt, and he did it in tiny ways that had monumental effects. The Step Pyramid at Saqqara wasn't just suddenly built with large blocks of limestone, no. What Imhotep did was he replaced the traditional organic and mud brick building materials with smaller blocks of limestone that were similar in size to their mud brick counterparts. Because he lacked the experience with building in large stone blocks, he used the knowledge that he already had and he innovated upon it. The architects who built the step pyramid also stacked these bricks at an incline, which made them a lot more stable and that allowed them to build as high as they did. They were also super smart in realizing that a pyramid is the shape that gives you the most stability for the least material. Material. Because once you're about a third of the way up, you're already about two thirds completed in regards to the amount of stone needed to build a pyramid. Imhotep and Djoser officially kicked off the pyramid age and the rest we say is history. After Djoser, around the year 2575 BCE, a guy named Sneferu came along who thought pyramids were so nice that he built them thrice. Sneferu first built a step pyramid at Maidum, but then he decided that he wanted a true pyramid, one with smooth edges. This didn't really work so well at Maidum because adding an extra limestone casing on the outside adds a lot of pressure onto the core. Having a smoothed out exterior is something you really want to plan from the start, so the pyramid at Maidum became a little bit unstable. Never fear though, because Sneferu tried again. This time it was at the site of Dashur. This pyramid didn't turn out so well either though. Firstly, they built it on sand, which isn't as sturdy a foundation as rock is. The precision wasn't quite there either, as they built it a little bit too steep and they had to change the slope partway through. This is why we call it the Bent Pyramid. Sneferu was a glass half full kind of guy though, and he said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. The third pyramid, what we call the Red Pyramid today, was built on a very level, solid foundation. The stones were laid in horizontal rows and then they precision cut the edges in order to make it look smooth and beautiful. Third time's the charm. Sneferu, after all of his trials and errors, finally figured out the right blueprint on how to build a pyramid. 
Round of applause for his perseverance. By looking at the evolution between Djoser's step pyramid and Snefru's three attempts, we can see that once they got going with this pyramid building idea, the Egyptians were able to learn from their mistakes fairly quickly and really perfect that process. This pyramid building extravaganza paved the way for Snefru's son Khufu to build the most epic pyramid of all time, the Great Pyramid of Giza. The Great Pyramid of Giza is so great that it covers an area of 13 acres and measures 200 130 meters wide by 146 meters tall. It is made out of 2.3 million stone blocks and each stone weighs about 2.5 tons on average. If you guys need a visual, here's me standing on the Great Pyramid for scale. So let's have a look at how this Great Pyramid of Giza might have been built. Step one, where's the perfect place to build a pyramid? The Giza Plateau was chosen because it's a plateau. It's already pretty flat and a solid flat base is needed for any good foundation when we're talking about any sort of building structure. Step two, how do you get all of the limestone and granite needed to even build this thing? Well, when you're planning out a building site, it's also important to look at the proximity of the building material. There's an excellent source of limestone just 320 meters away from the Great Pyramid. Perfect. These core stones are the stones that we see when we look at the pyramid today because the finer white limestone casing was removed a long time ago by looters. The finer limestone for the outer casing and the granite being used for the inner chamber, well, that can come from a bit farther away because for those parts of the pyramid, we're looking for quality over quantity. But in order for that material to easily travel to the site and in order to import all other materials and food needed to build the pyramid, the area needs to be close to the Nile for easy connections. Before the construction of the Aswan Dam, the Nile used to flood right up to the Giza Plateau, making it the perfect area for pyramid construction. So we have our location. Now, how did the great pyramid get laid out so well that it aligns almost perfectly with true north. When we look at it, the Great Pyramid is oriented pretty damn accurately to the cardinal directions. When it comes to their art and architecture, the ancient Egyptians loved their grids. They were very mathematical about these things, so it's not surprising that they would have taken such care in planning and orienting the pyramid. The pyramid is aligned to true north by one tenth of a degree. Why they oriented it with such precision isn't quite clear, but from looking at pyramid text from the fifth dynasty, we can assume that it probably had something to do with the journey of the soul into the afterlife. And while we don't know exactly how they did it, we have a few theories. The first way they could have done it is finding true north by tracking the shadow of the sun throughout the day, particularly on the fall equinox as that's when it's most accurate. And then you find the midway point between east and west. That's one way to do it, but other methods like using the North Star combined with a lot of lines and ropes have also been suggested. We know that the North Star doesn't move and ancient civilizations were no stranger to astronomy, so they would have known how to use this star to their advantage. If we look at the orientation of all of the pyramids at Giza, they're all slightly counterclockwise. This actually correlates with the results from some experimental archeology span done using that sun shadow method. So it seems like that probably could have been the way that they mapped out the orientation. The ancient Egyptians had full on foundation rituals for building projects. And one of them was called the stretching of the cord ceremony. We have evidence of this from wall reliefs dating from around the second dynasty. The cord was used to measure out the building and to align it with the stars. It's not an exact science like we have today for building, but it's pretty damn close. We still use ropes and basic mathematical techniques to map out building sites and archaeological squares today. So I think we can all agree that the ancient Egyptians would have had this knowledge readily available. Also, as a really quick note here, we've found some shafts that were dug into the ground very similar to the angles of the shafts built inside the pyramid itself. They've been called test shafts and are located about 87 meters away from the Great Pyramid. The shafts have been dated to the same time as Khufu and the theories behind them are that they could have either been a trial in order to plan things properly for when they were building the real pyramid, or they could have been some sort of astronomy tool to properly align the pyramid to true north. Now, once the pyramid has been mapped out, we need to set up the foundation. The Giza Plateau may be flat, but it's not quite ready for building flat. So that means they would have had to level the land off to some degree. The ancient Egyptians were very smart though. And instead of leveling off the entire area, they just decided to level off the edges of the foundation in order to have a flat base around it. How they exactly did this, we don't really no, they could have flooded the area with water to see which parts were level and which weren't, or they could have used plumb bobs, which we know that they used in other building projects. So we have a location, check. The Great Pyramid is mapped out, 
double check. But how did people in the Bronze Age cut these large blocks of limestone and granite with using only basic tools? For quarrying and cutting the stones, the ancient Egyptians used very basic materials. They used things like hammers made out of dolerite, either with just the rock itself or with a little bit of a haft on it. They also used drills made out of stone and copper, and they used copper saws. You might think that these wouldn't do the trick, but dolerite is a very hard stone, and limestone itself is quite soft, so you can really just bang it out. There's also lots of evidence of stone and copper drills being used to carve out limestone, alabaster, and even granite vessels centuries before the pyramids were being built. Drills were sort of like long sticks weighted with rocks on the top, and they had a stone or a copper borer on the bottom, and they looked sort of like this. The limestone blocks that formed the core of the Great Pyramid didn't have to be too, too precise, as they would have been covered with a finer limestone casing at the end. But that being said, they're still pretty well cut. Cutting limestone is one thing, but cutting and carving granite is another. Granite has a 7 on the Mohs hardness scale, whereas limestone only has about a hardness of 3. It's a lot more difficult to cut through granite, and the exact techniques aren't quite known, but in the pyramid we do have evidence of cut and saw marks on the stone, so they were clearly able to get it done, and they probably did it with copper saws. Copper is a super soft metal and can't cut granite on its own, but Dennis Stocks has done some amazing experimental archaeology work on this, and has shown that when sand, which has a similar hardness to granite, is thrown into the mix, copper saws can cut through granite extremely well. Of course, the sawing with sand and on a hard stone does deteriorate the copper blade quite a bit, but they had the technology for it, and look what they did with it. So we know how they cut the stone. Awesome. Now, how did the ancient Egyptians move these giant blocks? There's been a lot of debate about this, and a lot of different theories have come about. We've actually found some pictorial evidence of the ancient Egyptians moving very heavy things in the tomb of the Middle Kingdom nomarch Jehuti Hotep. A nomarch is sort of like a provincial governor. Anyways, there's a relief in his tomb that depicts the transportation of a colossal statue of himself. The statue is said to have been almost 7 meters tall, and to have weighed approximately 58 tons. This thing was huge! Remember that the stones that make up the Great Pyramid weighed only about two and a half tons on average. So that means that the statue of Jehuti Hotep was over 25 times heavier than the average pyramid stone. In comparison to this giant statue, moving stone blocks would have just been a walk in the park for ancient Egyptians. What's really fascinating about the relief of Jehuti Hotep is the method being used to move the statue. The relief shows the statue being transported on a sledge with 172 workers pulling the ropes. Dragging something that big and heavy through sand would have been next to impossible, but you might have also noticed that there are people standing on top of the sledge pouring water onto the sand. We didn't know why they were there at first, but research done at the University of Amsterdam, my alma mater, little humble brag there if I do say so myself, conducted some experiments and concluded that the addition of 5% water to sand reduces friction by about 30% in comparison to dry sand. So maybe the ancient Egyptians were onto something here. For the rest of the stones coming from farther away, they were loaded onto either boats or rafts and floated down the Nile to Giza. Giza would have had a harbor at the time to bring all of these goods in. The ancient Egyptians were no strangers to the Nile, so they would have figured out how to do this without too much difficulty. So we see that the ancient Egyptians could have moved these large stones over sand and water quite easily, but what about moving the stone up height as the pyramid building progressed? How did the ancient Egyptians during the Bronze Age haul these crazy heavy stones up onto the structure? This is when we get to talk about everyone's favorite topic, the ramps. There are three main ramp designs that people refer to when trying to answer this question. There's the straight, the zigzag, and the wraparound ramp, and some people have also mentioned the possibility of internal ramps. If we look at surviving ramps on other structures, they appear to just be these straight ramps. But of course, none of these surviving ramps are on structures that even compare in size to the Great Pyramid of Giza, so we need to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But the mere presence of these straight ramps does mean that we can't rule this possibility out, and they probably most definitely used a ramp system for some, if not the entire pyramid construction. The problem with a full-on straight ramp is that to get to the top, it would need to be either super, super steep or super, super long. Some research has shown that if the ramp were any steeper than 8 to 12 degrees, it would be too steep for the workers to drag the stones. If the ramp they made followed this really low incline, it would have almost been 2 kilometers long, and they did not have the space for that on the Giza Plateau. Also, the amount of material needed to build a ramp of this 
this size would have been ridiculous. Like it would have taken the same amount, if not more material to build a long ramp than it would have been to build the Great Pyramid itself. A straight ramp could have very well been used for the foundation though, because if we built a ramp from the quarry to the Great Pyramid at a low incline, it actually would have allowed them to build the bottom 30 meters or so of the pyramid. As I said earlier, pyramids are really good to build because once you're about a third of the way completed, you've already done most of your work and you've already used most of the materials that you need. This means that with a low ramp like this, you could get a lot finished. There are other theories about a wraparound ramp, a zigzag ramp, and an interior ramp. And until recently, I was always a really big fan of the wraparound ramp, even though it had some problems like prohibiting the architects from seeing the corners and making sure that they're maintaining the proper angle when building it. The wraparound ramp would have also drastically slowed down the construction rate and probably would have taken a lot longer than the 20 years that it took to build the Great Pyramid. I think I liked it so much because it's so aesthetically pleasing. Now I said I preferred the wraparound ramp until recently because in 2018, an amazing discovery was made at the quarry of Hatnub. Researchers from the University of Liverpool and the French Institute for Oriental Archaeology uncovered a ramp that based on tool marks and inscriptions dates to about 4,500 years ago, which is when Khufu would have been around. The ramp at Hatnub was used to haul large stones of alabaster. You can see in the picture that it had a place for the sledge to be dragged. It had a staircase on either side and it also had post holes going along each side as well. And get this, the incline was 20 degrees. That is super steep. Ropes were likely to be tied to the posts that were in these post holes and they would have acted as something like a force multiplier, making it a lot easier to pull the stone up the ramp. The discovery of this ramp means that Egyptians in the Old Kingdom would have been familiar with how to carry blocks of stone up steep ramps, which completely changes our assumptions as to how the pyramids might have been built. Of course, we'll probably never know exactly how the pyramids were built or how they maintained such a precise angle while building it. We also won't know what exact tools and techniques were used unless by some miracle we come across a giant stone slab that someone decided to carve, giving us a step-by-step -step approach to how they did it. But what I've given you here is the archaeological evidence. As you can see, we're still making significant discoveries that can blow our current ideas and thought processes completely out the window. After the Great Pyramid was built, we get the pyramids of Khafre and Mankare, and pharaohs continue to build pyramids for nearly 700 years. But you probably haven't heard about any of those, have you? That's because just like with capitalism ruining the longevity of things that we buy today, efficiency and cost beats quality and durability. The very sturdy cores of the pyramids of Snefru and the pyramids of Giza started to be replaced with lower quality and smaller rough cut blocks. Building Khufu's Great Pyramid at Giza was a complex and expensive event that was so difficult to achieve. People probably started to think that the amount of effort just wasn't worth it. So instead they looked for alternatives and more effective methods. And yes, while these smaller, lower quality pyramids were still encased in this bright, white, high quality limestone to mask the less than perfect craftsmanship underneath, once this finer stone was removed by looters and repurposed for other things, the lower quality cores just couldn't stand the test of time like the ones at Giza could, and they collapsed into rubble. This is why you probably haven't heard about any of the other pyramids in Egypt, because they just look like a giant heap of rocks nowadays. Now, even after dropping all of these hard facts on you, I'm sure there are still some of you out there yelling at your screens saying, this is impossible, that's not how they were built, you haven't looked at all of the other evidence yet. And to all of you, I say subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell because in my next video, I'm going to be taking on some of the most popular conspiracy theories about the pyramids and I am not holding back. Big thanks to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you want to join the Patreon community, the link is down in my description below, as well as are all of my references that I used to make this video. So if you want to learn more about how the pyramids were built, get into the archeological journals, things like that, I've got all the links down there for you. Go ahead and check them out. Here are all of my socials. And as always, stay dirty, my friends.